Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hello, and welcome to those of you here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the Director of Voices and Leadership. This series focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. We're broadcasting from the Leadership Studio, where the programs and related content have received over four million views to date and counting. Today, we host a discussion entitled, Leadership in Our Times, a conversation with Ambassador Wendy Sherman. Wendy Sherman is Professor of the Practice of Public Leadership and Director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. Ambassador Sherman led the U.S. negotiating team that reached agreement on a joint comprehensive plan of action between the P5 plus 1, the European Union, and Iran, for which she was awarded the National Security Medal by President Barack Obama. Prior to her service at the State Department, she was Vice Chair and Founding Partner of the Albright Stonebridge Group, Counselor of the Department of State Under Secretary Madeleine Albright, Special Advisor to President Clinton, and Assistant Secretary of Legislative Affairs Under Secretary Warren Christopher. Ambassador Sherman began her career as Director of Child Welfare for the State of Maryland. Later, she managed Barbara Mikulski's successful campaign for the U.S. Senate. She served as director of EMILY's List and ran Campaign 88 at the Democratic National Convention for the Dukakis presidential campaign. Ambassador Sherman is the author of Not for the Faint of Heart, Lessons in Courage, Power, and Persistence. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Professor Meredith Rosenthal, please join me as we welcome Ambassador Wendy Sherman to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. So, Wendy, if I may. Please, please, <laughs> um, Meredith. <laughs> like many of the most interesting people I know, your career seems to have unfolded not exactly in a straight line. Uh, but as I look across it, uh, what I can discern is that you have tackled a series of hard and important problems, which to me sounds like the definition of a purposeful life. Uh, thinking back to your work uh, in Maryland in the, as the Director of Child Welfare, can you tell me a little bit about how the work you did there informed or influenced your next steps? Um, thank you, and first of all, it's just terrific to be here at uh, the School of Public Health. It's critical to all of us, and as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the Obama administration, public health was on our minds all of the time, and of course, lived through the Ebola crisis, which really took an international response. So I'm really delighted to be here. Um, you know, I tell students that I wish them what I have had, which is an unexpected life. I think it's the best uh, sort of kind of opportunities that one gets. I have a master's in social work, in community organizing, and I've also gotten a lot of good clinical skills, which have helped me a lot with uh, dictators and, uh, and members of Congress, uh, not to say they're the same thing. Uh, and that set of skills I've used in everything I've done in the long range of things that uh, Eric Anderson, the director here, uh, elaborated some of in his introduction. Uh, and what it really told me is that, taught me, was how to look at a landscape, see all the stakeholders, uh, define an objective, figure out how you want to get there, um, how you can realize it, what the alternatives are, what are the costs and benefits mm -hmm. of each of those alternatives, and then how you implement and ex execute on it. I was only 30 years old when I became the Director of Child Welfare in Maryland. It was the first time there was a Director of Child Welfare, and um, quite frankly, it was insane uh, to give me that job. Um, <laughs> And what I learned there, I've used all the rest of my life, which is no one of us, even if we are the leader, ever gets the job done without a really fantastic team. Uh, I could not have survived in that job without a team 
of really terrific experts. And secondly, nowhere have I worked that I have not built a support team for myself. Uh, and certainly as the first director who didn't know what she was doing, um, having that support team, which included my boss actually, who was also brand new to Maryland, Ruth Masinga, really extraordinary uh, woman, African-American woman, first in that position as the Secretary for Human uh, Services and Human Resources in the state of Maryland. Uh, a group of us would meet on Thursday evenings down in the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. Uh, in those days, it was having a drink of bourbon, uh, and um, uh, not anymore, uh, and uh, really supporting each other. So I think those are both really critical and have been critical everywhere I went. The last thing I'd say, uh, being, uh, being the Director of Child Welfare, is uh, child welfare is a public health crisis mm. in this country, uh, particularly our foster care system, our system for child abuse and neglect, uh, still remains a tremendous challenge. Mm. Uh, we don't have all the resources we need. Uh, we don't have the attention of legislators. We don't have the attention of the public. And children don't have a voice in our electoral system, so they depend on us uh, to try to make sure that their needs are taken care of. And that's something we all have to dedicate ourselves to every single day. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, as you think back uh, to the, the early part of your career, who, who were the leaders or, or mentors that helped inspire and, and shape the direction you took? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as I say in the first chapter of my book, which is about courage, which I think is essential for someone to be a leader, uh, the greatest mentors I had, and I was fortunate to have them, were my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, they were activists early in their lives. When they were first married, my dad was in the Marine Corps in World War II. He was wounded and uh, came back for some treatment on the west coast of the country. And he very much didn't want there to be war anymore, neither did my mother, of course. Uh, and so he helped to found, still as an enlisted man, what eventually became the American Veterans Committee. And both of my parents attended the founding conference of the United Nations. I have a phenomenal scrapbook about that seminal moment in American history where people said, look, we've got to come together as the world or we don't want this so this doesn't happen again. Uh, and so I always knew that having a public purpose was important. And then when I was a teenager, uh, my parents went to Rosh Hashanah services. I'm Jewish American. Uh, and the rabbi, Morris Lieberman, had just been arrested for trying to integrate uh, an amusement park, Win Oak Park, just outside of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And he thought he owed his congregation um, an explanation of why he allowed himself to be arrested. He was part of a clergyman's mm -hmm. group of activists. And he said he'd been a chaplain in World War II, and he'd been at the liberation of mm -hmm. Dachau. And it made him wonder, what did ministers and priests mm -hmm. uh, preach to their congregation as Jews and homosexuals and gypsies uh, were taken away? Mm -hmm. Uh, and he thought for him in this time, his responsibility was to stop the degradation and discrimination of African Americans. My parents were very moved. My father went to see Rabbi Lieberman a few days later and said, what can I do to help? He was in residential real estate. He sold homes. Mm -hmm. And the rabbi said, you are more powerful than any priest or rabbi uh, or minister. You could sell houses to anybody who wants them. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, there were no open housing laws at that time. Mm. Uh, and uh, he said, if I do that, I'll be run out of town. And the rabbi said, as rabbis are wont to do, you ask me what you could do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you can do. And so my parents talked about it and did it. Within six months, my father's listings had dropped by 60%. By the end of the decade, even though he added other services uh, to his business, he closed his doors. Uh, but my parents never regretted what they'd done. We'd moved to a smaller house. We had people calling our house and threatening to bomb our house or moving those people next door to us, mm -hmm. all kinds of ugliness. Uh, but it taught me an important lesson that to do the right thing usually will come with a cost. But if it is the right mm -hmm. thing, it is worth doing, and that's really led me all through the rest of my life. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, one of the other uh, the other areas that you've worked in that Eric mentioned earlier is that you worked on helping women get elected to set to the Senate, 
And, um, and today, we have made quite a lot of progress, but it's been hard fought, and there are, there's obviously a lot more work to be done. But what do you see as the main challenges there and opportunities to uh, improve diversity quite broadly I among our elected officials? It's critically important. I was really proud to be Senator Mikulski's campaign manager for the first Democratic woman to be elected to the Senate in her own right, which really took too long to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was the first undersecretary for political affairs who was a woman. Mm -hmm. I served with Madeleine Albright, the first secretary of state, and worked very hard for Hillary Clinton, uh, who became the first uh, woman to be the nominee of her party for president. But as you pointed out, we still have a long way to go in academia as well. Yes. Uh, there aren't enough women professors, and there are not enough diverse professors, mm -hmm. uh, people of color and of different religions and different points of view uh, all along the political spectrum. And that's a responsibility each of us has to take on uh, to try to make that happen. I think it's very hard for women to run for office, but we saw in 2016 millions of women take to the streets and good men um, all across the world, not just in our country. And Emily's List, which usually had about 1,000 women who came to them each year wanting to get some training and see whether they should run for office, had over 30,000 women mm -hmm. after that march. Mm -hmm. Uh, want to run for office. Many of them will have decided not to. Many of them who run won't win the first time. But you need that deep bench uh, to be able to change the numbers, and it's true for people of color as well. We have attitudes in our country uh, that we have to change uh, our own about how we see uh, people different from us. Uh, and how we have to believe that hearing their voices are important for our society to really prosper. Uh, and I think for women in particular, it's very hard for them to win executive positions. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have women in corporate uh, CEO positions in, to a great extent. We, people don't see women as holding that kind of power. Mm -hmm. Women have to get comfortable with exercising power. Uh, we often think of it as icky. Uh, and it's not. It's quite important, uh, particularly when you use power to do good, of course, mm -hmm. uh, to have purpose in that power. Uh, but we still have a lot of uh, barriers and obstacles here, uh, and we all need a lot of discussion with each other to break down those barriers and open opportunity. Thank you. Um, now, uh, thinking a little bit um, about the work that you have done that I think comes to mind when we talk about your great accomplishments, um, I'm wondering if you can think about the way you approached leadership in these very high stakes uh, areas in the negotiations, for example, and, and how you think about those power dynamics that come into play when you're, you're entering into that sphere. Yeah, I've been very lucky. I've been able to negotiate with all the great people in the world, uh, the North Koreans, the uh, Iranians, um, uh, with Cuba, and Middle East peace, all the easy ones, um, and lots of others. Um, I think, uh, first of all, you have to be very clear about what your objective is, what you're trying to accomplish. President Obama was really clear on the case of Iran that Iran could not obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, and then you have to figure out, well, what does that mean? How do you show that? How do you prove that? What are the sub-objectives? What's your strategy for getting there? It takes not only that great team, and I had a core team of 15 incredible human beings and professionals, um, but I also had literally hundreds, thousands in the U.S. government who backed up what we did. Um, it takes a lot of consultation. I, I only half joke. I consulted inside the administration. I consulted with the U.S. Congress. I consulted with think tanks and opinion leaders in the U.S. Uh, I consulted with each one of my uh, P5 plus one, our, my partners in the negotiations, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, Germany. Uh, with she, they were the plus one. China, Russia, the European Union. I negotiated with Israel on a regular basis negotiated with the Gulf Arab states. I negotiated with countries like Korea and Japan, who had uh, a large amount of oil they imported from Iran. And oh, yeah, uh, negotiated with Iran. Uh, it is a very complex, time-consuming process. And I had to do this 
while I was the undersecretary responsible for the rest of the world. I um, went to 54 other countries during the four years that I was undersecretary. To be able to do all of that takes a great team uh, of people who back you up. I had a chief of staff who stayed with me for four years. She could do everything I could do, only better. Uh, and so I could rely on her when I was not in Washington. She kept me informed when I had to make decisions. So I put an enormous value in not only the right people in the right place, having the right objective, thinking through your strategy, taking the time to do all of the footwork you need to do. I'm teaching a course right now that's called Away from the Table. Everything you really need to know to get the job done because if you haven't done all of the work outside the room, inside the room is never going to work. Uh, and so understanding history, culture, norms, power dynamics, uh, policy, the tools at your disposal, how you set the table for a negotiation, all of that has to happen or the room will not succeed. Well, speaking of power dynamics, <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit, I, I know you, you've raised this in, in your book and earlier already in our conversation, but the way you think your identity as a Jewish woman um, entered the room as you were negotiating in Iran in particular, but in general how identity uh, affects the way you lead and the way you negotiate. One thing I learned uh, from my former boss, dear friend, and business partner in Albright Stonebridge Group, Madeline Albright, is she said to me, you know, when you go into a negotiating room as a government official, you're less Wendy Sherman, less um, an American, less uh, a woman, Jewish American. You're the United States of America. <laughs> and no that's, pressure. No pressure. <laughs> and that's pretty powerful. Uh, and so, we all have roles, and if you understand the power with that role, we're all, many of us are parents. Uh, we know we have power that comes with that role. We also know there are limitations to the power. I tell parents, if you have a two-year-old or a teenager, you know how to negotiate, <laughs> right? Uh, so understanding the power that comes with your role, um, really embracing that, making use of it, but also knowing the limitations of it. My P5 plus one partners could veto what we did. Uh, they might not have had as deep a bench. They might not have had the military or economic wherewithal that we had. Uh, but uh, they could stop something from happening. Uh, and I understood that. So I understood the limitations of the power I had, but also the burden that I had. Um, there are times when being a woman uh, is, helps and hurts. Uh, it helps sometimes because sometimes you can say very tough things that need to be said and they are heard differently. Uh, they sometimes can be more acceptable uh, than if a guy says them to another guy and it's sort of a mano a mano, uh, who's tougher uh, than the other. Uh, sometimes it's harder. In the case of Iran, I could not shake hands with the Iranians. They are conservative, conservative Muslims. Uh, and on the margins of one of the negotiating rounds, I, uh, you know, I knew that when I went in a room, we women sort of go like this. But if you do that uh, to a whole room full of men after five minutes, you sort of looks like a Marx Brothers routine. <laughs> so uh, on the margins, I said to Abbas Arachi and Majid Ravanchi, my counterparts, uh, you know, it's awkward, I know, that we can't shake hands. Uh, but I grew up in a Jewish community. They were sort of horrified for a moment. They didn't know where I was going with this. <laughs> uh, since they have denied the Holocaust and want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And I said, you know, with Orthodox Jewish men, I don't shake their hands either. And I don't put out my hand until they put out their hands, because I don't know who's Orthodox and who's not. And it was difficult at the beginning, but it became an important conversation because, you know, we went into the negotiating room. We were as tough as we each needed to be representing our country's interests, but it showed a little humanity and a little common ground that just sort of gives you a little bit more space to have that negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, preparation? When you got into this role where you were going to be 
taking leading these very important negotiations. Uh, I understand you've been you've been very clear about how important the whole team is, but but for you personally, in doing that work, uh, w what was necessary to really prepare for that kind of role? So I talked to the people who had been working on Iran, mm -hmm. who knew it in ways I didn't. I spent time with really our extraordinary intelligence community mm -hmm. uh, who could share with me all of their insights and what they knew. Um, Bill Burns, who had been my predecessor, who's really the diplomat's diplomat, mm -hmm. Uh, who had been elevated to Deputy Secretary of State. Um, you know, I was the Iran negotiator because I was the Undersecretary for Political Affairs, which in our system is the political director, and the negotiations were done at the political director level. So it didn't have to do with me, Wendy Sherman, it had to do with my role. And so I went to see Bill, who had done it before me, and I said, Bill, would you like to hold on to this remit? Because, you know, I want it. He's the Deputy Secretary. If he wanted to, he certainly could have. And he said, oh, no, it's all yours. <laughs> uh, but he was very helpful, and he obviously led the secret channel, the secret bilateral channel uh, for uh, that process. Uh, and so he gave me a lot of insights. And I watched him during the bilateral negotiations, because I came in towards the end, because I was going to have to transfer that secret negotiation into the multilateral negotiation. So I learned a lot from others. Uh, and uh, was very humble throughout the process about what I didn't know. And on my team, I had people who did know Iran very well. We had a full-time person who we called our Farsi spokesperson, a uh, phenomenal civil servant named Alan Eyre, I'm sorry, Foreign Service officer named Alan Eyre, who um, during the negotiations, his job was to read all the Farsi websites and to tell me what was going on and explain how the Iranians were reacting to what was happening. Uh, so um, stay humble, learn a whole lot, uh, and uh, get ready. Well, since we're talking about that region now, I have to ask, I think many of us have been reading the news anxiously, and I wonder if you could help us understand what we're seeing uh, and think about uh, what next steps might look like in the region uh, around Syria in particular and Iran's role in all of that. And wh what might we look for um, in terms of stabilizing? Uh, I'm looking for an optimistic view, but also <laughs> a realistic view of what's happening. I don't think the Middle East has been stable mm -hmm. for as long as I've been alive, mm -hmm. pretty much. Uh, and I've been alive a long time now. Um, so I don't have, unfortunately, a super optimistic uh, tale to tell you. Um, you know, I'm very glad that the President gave the order for our special operators and our community to uh, get al-Baghdadi. That's important. It's an important step in our counter-terrorist efforts. It does not end ISIS. Mm -hmm. I regret the president did it after <laughs> he had announced he was pulling the troops on the basis of a telephone conversation with Prime Minister Erdogan, mm -hmm. who, quite frankly, does not have our interests in mind at all. Uh, he has in mind uh, eliminating the Kurds mm -hmm. uh, because he sees every Kurd as a terrorist. Uh, I don't believe that's the case, but he does. And there certainly have been. Uh, the PKK has been a terrorist organization that has been an issue for Turkey for some time, but not all Kurds are terrorists, mm -hmm. uh, to be sure. Uh, so I regret the timing of it, and indeed we're seeing now the president's putting troops back into Syria, ostensibly to protect the oil, which makes no sense. We don't own the oil. The Kurds had taken over responsibility for the oil, and the oil is Syrian oil. It's not our oil, and quite frankly, we don't need oil. We produce tons of oil now. Uh, here in the United States. We're not dependent on the Middle East. We're not dependent on Saudi Arabia anymore for our energy needs. So I um, think we're in a very hard place. I do think <laughs> Russia has gotten a foothold in the Middle East it did not have before because of its support for Assad. Um, I do wish the Yemen war was over. I think the Emiratis have decided they've had enough of it. Um, and I hope there are some peace talks going on somewhere that are actually gaining a foothold. I don't think it's in Saudi Arabia's interest for them to go on anymore either. Uh, we are seeing changes in uh, Israeli leadership. Uh, one would hope that that leadership might produce an opportunity for talks between uh, Palestinians and uh, Israelis to 
find uh, a land for peace resolution, land for, secu land for security uh, for Israel, uh, because I do worry about Israel's security, not only from Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, but from Iran. Uh, so it is unfortunately very unstable. And I think what is most important is that we have reestablished the importance of diplomacy. Uh, one of the things that I've been very saddened by is, for whatever reason, the State Department has really been demolished in many ways. We have a lot of acting one things or that things, and a lot of positions not filled. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing in the impeachment proceedings a lot of diplomats coming forward, uh, concerned about what's going on. And we depend on our diplomats to do a lot out in the world. So I hope that uh, whoever is president uh, in our next round reestablishes the importance of diplomacy. Well, Wendy, one of the reasons we're so excited to have you at the university now is this seems like an incredible time and opportunity to really invest in public leadership here. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about what you think you hope to do in the Center for Public Leadership. Uh, what kinds of things do you think students and, and fellows and others who come to the CPL need to learn about public leadership? My colleagues are going to be so thrilled you asked. <laughs> um, and I am too. Um, I was in Washington perfectly happy, and I was not looking for a new job. Uh, and uh, Dean Doug Elmendorf asked if I'd c consider putting my hat into the ring for this. And after many conversations, my husband and I decided to take on this adventure, which it is. And the reason is because we both uh, were very concerned about the state of public leadership, not only in this country, but around the world. Half of the students at the Kennedy School are from other places, not from the United States. It's a very rich, diverse conversation. And we all are concerned that people all around the world, and certainly in our country, who feel tremendous anxiety about the future, about their jobs, about how fast things are changing in the social sphere. I'm glad that people who love each other can marry each other. But that change happened very rapidly. And for a lot of people, it unsettled them. They didn't know where they stood anymore, uh, challenged uh, their personal values, perhaps. Um, Technology has changed things. People have lost jobs. Healthcare is terribly expensive here. Educating your kids costs a lot of money. Um, we don't know what artificial intelligence is going to do. So in that uncertainty and anxiety, people are turning to autocrats or strong men, often, who can say to them, I'll take care of you. Give up a few of your civil liberties in the process, but I'll take care of you. And so I thought it was important that we challenge the students who are going to be our leaders in the future uh, to get the skills they need to be the authentic leaders that we need, principled, effective, uh, to learn how to, to know uh, the scholarship and the history around what makes great leaders and who those role models are, uh, to know about the issues going into the future so they can embrace them and bring about the change that we all want for a secure, prosperous, principled future. Um, I'm really uh, get my hope from those students every single day. I'm sure that's true here uh, at the Chan School of Public Health. Um, I see a really bright, resilient future ahead. Uh, it's just going to take a little while for us to get there. Well, so you've made a really compelling case why we need good public leadership. Um, in our last few minutes, uh, could you say a little bit to the people out there who are considering moving into the public sector as leaders here or elsewhere, given what might reasonably be described as a somewhat chaotic environment in, in many of the uh, industrialized democracies around the world, wh why should people uh, take this path? We need you. <laughs> We need you really badly. Um, most students probably won't come in at the very top level where big, big policy is being decided. They will come in to work on policies that are critical to people's day-to-day -day lives, probably out of the sphere of a lot of the turmoil of politics. And some of that turmoil will settle down after our presidential election here. Uh, 
if uh, the United Kingdom ever gets to the end of Brexit. You know, there's a joke going <laughs> around that 2190. 19, uh, there will still be requests for an extension. So, uh, you know, obviously Chancellor Merkel's time as leader of Germany is coming to a close. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but it won't stay that way forever. So we need our best, our most talented to challenge the leaders that are there, uh, to um, really be the patriots that we need. I look at all of the people who are coming forward for these hearings, who are foreign service officers, civil servants, military leaders. Uh, for me, they are not the deep state. They are the deep patriotism mm -hmm. that we need. Uh, they are the people that we are training here to do the right thing whenever they feel that their values and the moral stakes of our country are being challenged. And that's not about whether you agree on big policy, because we have a range of view about whether we should have Medicare for all or a private insurance system. That's a different debate. Mm -hmm. But in all of that debate, there are a set of values that here in the United States we believe in under, under our Constitution. And we need to train to hold on to those values here and the values of every other nation state's uh, belief in what they need to do to ensure they have a strong future. Thank you for landing us on that positive note and for joining us today. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. <laughs>